Is there an event I'm missing on campus, or what? What is today? There's free cake at the alumni house. Free cake? Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty weak. All right, DJ drop tables. Thank you. Always. All right. Um, all right. Let's, let's for those who are here. Let's let's get through this. Um, so again, this is just the 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 outline for the remaining things for you guys in the semester. Um, again, th these dates are all available on the website, uh, and then the extra credit for the uh, for the first feedback re review of the extra credit will be due uh, this Sunday. And then I also posted on, on Piazza last night. If you haven't done this already, please go vote for what database systems you want me to cover on the last day. Yes. So I was kind of worried about the preference order before taking advantage of this. So can you tell whether the results of the petition? The results of what? Sorry. The results of what? Sorry. <laughs> results. Oh shit! Right. Yeah. No, I have not heard back yet. I will try. If it comes in, I will announce it on the last day of class. I send it. I send it on Monday. I don't. It takes whatever a week or two or something. So we'll see. Any other questions related to the class? <laughs> Again, I don't think it looks like me. Um, I, this is to say, my wife lives a certain lifestyle where I, I would have questions. Okay. So. Uh, Last class, we talked about it was sort of introduction to, to distributed databases. Um, and sort of the, the main three things we, we focused on was uh, what's the system architecture of a system looks like. Right? We talked about shared memory, shared disk, shared nothing. And I said that most distributed databases, or actually every distributed database that's out there, is either going to be shared disk or shared nothing. Shared nothing is traditionally the more popular approach people take with distributed databases. But shared disk is becoming more prevalent in cloud architectures. Um, then we talked about how to do partitioning or sharding, the hash partitioning, range partitioning, or round robin, which is again, a way to take a database to break it up into uh, disjoint subsets that we assign to different, different, different nodes. And then we talked a little bit about the end about how we want to do transaction coordination uh, of whether we have a centralized approach that has a global view of what's going on in, throughout the entire system in the context of what, tr what transactions are trying to do. Or a decentralized approach where the the nodes themselves are responsible for figuring out uh, you know whether things are allowed to commit or not. So the last class, all these topics are sort of with uh, except maybe for transaction coordination, but it, for the most part, everything I talked about last class are applicable to both uh, distributed databases that are designed to run transactions uh, or distributed databases that are designed to run designed to run analytics. So for this class and then Monday's, Monday's class next week, we're now going to divide up talking about specific issues for each of those two classes of workloads. Because there's different trade-offs that they're going to make that may be good for transactions but not good for analytics and vice versa. So again, just as a reminder for, for what I mean when I say transaction processing versus analytical processing, OLTB versus OLAP, again, I think we've covered this a couple of times throughout the semester just to, to reiterate this the, the dichotomy so that everyone's on the same page. In OLTB workloads, we're worrying about operational operations that are trying to update uh, or read a small amount of data in, in the database. So again, using Amazon as an example, when you go to the Amazon website, you add things to your cart, you make purchases for your account, you update your payment information. All those operations are transactions that are only touching, you know, as, you know, when you invoke those changes, they're only touching your data. So the Amazon data, database is quite large, but for your transactions to update, you know, do your operations, the, the amount of data you're touching is, is small. And essentially, the database system is doing the same, same set of operations over and over again. Because right? you're going through the, the website application code that, that you know, when you click on you know, add to cart, that invokes a function on the application code, which then goes through and executes the queries to, to make those changes. In OLAP workloads, this is where we now start doing analytics to try to extrapolate new information from all the data we've, we've ingested on the OLTP side. So again, using Amazon as an example, an analytical workload would be something like trying to figure out what was the most popular item uh, for Carnegie Mellon students during the month of November uh, when, the, when the temperature was, was you know, above 30 degrees. So that's not something you would do in OLTP because that's, you know, that's not a transactional thing. This is something you do in the OLAP side. So these workloads, are the queries are much are running longer because they're touching more data. Uh, they're doing joins, they're doing aggregations. And oftentimes, they are one-off queries uh, because someone's trying to say, you know, answer that question, oh, what's the most bought item?
for a particular group of people and you know they're filling out some dashboard or using a analytical tool to co compose the query and then firing that off and may, may, the data system may never see that query ever again so again for today's class we're going to focus on the, the first part OLTP. next class we'll talk about OLAP so the again just to go at a high level discuss the uh, what we're talking about in distributed database what we're going to focus on today we talked about the setup before we have some partition database uh, whether it's logical partitioning or physical partitioning, meaning is it shared nothing or shared disk, we, we, you know, I'm not explaining just yet. It doesn't matter for what we're talking about here today. But the, the scenario we're concerned about is we have an a application server that wants to invoke a transaction. It picks some partition node to be the master one. So it tells that guy, hey, I want to execute a transaction. Then it goes ahead and does a bunch of updates or reads a bunch of data on our various partitions. And then now when the transaction is complete, it goes to the master guy that it started off with and says, hey, I want to go ahead and commit. And assuming this is a decentralized architecture, meaning we don't have that middleware, we don't have the, the TP monitor that's coordinating all our transactions, now these nodes have to figure out amongst themselves whether they're allowed to commit this transaction. So last class, I was very vague about this step here, how to determine whether it's safe to commit. And what does it mean to say, hey, we're all going to go ahead and commit this transaction? So this is what we're going to primarily going to focus on today, this, this last step here. And so essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to have in our database system, we're trying to have uh, all the nodes agree that we should commit a transaction. And if everyone agrees that we commit this transaction and we go ahead and commit it, we don't want any sort of weird anomaly or weird reversal of, you know, one node said it was going to commit and then all of a sudden it doesn't, that transaction got rolled back. Once everyone agrees that we're going to go to commit, then we go ahead and commit this. So now there's a bunch of issues that we have to deal with in order to make this happen correctly and safely. When we were on a shared everything system, meaning we, our database system was running on a single box, and we wanted to do our, you know, a validation protocol for OCC concurrency control, the, all the participants in deciding whether this thing's allowed to commit was running together in, in a single machine, all in the same memory, possibly, and it was really fast and, uh, for us to figure out whether we're allowed to go ahead and commit. And then if we said commit, then it truly was committed because we you know everything was on that single box. But now in the shipping environment, we have the issue of, let's say we go ahead and say to commit, everyone comes back and says we go commit, and then maybe I, you know, during that time, one node goes down. What should happen? Right? All the same asset properties we talked about before, that we don't want any partial updates that are you know, persisting to, to our database, all the things we, we have to account for. So if a node goes down, all right, we've got to deal with that. But what if the node doesn't go down, and instead our commit messages just sort of show up late, right? The packet got delayed somehow on, on the network on the way over, or which is probably more common, say our database system was, was you know, using the JVM, like it's written in Java, it's written in Scala, it's using the JVM, and all of a sudden the JVM decides to do a really expensive garbage collection sweep. And now our process pauses. So we're going to look like we're, we're, we're unavailable while, during this GC, GC pass. And then all of a sudden we come back after the GC and now our messages are, are, arrive and it's, you know, a second has passed. And then what happens if we decide that, have we determined how many nodes have to agree that we're going to commit a transaction to decide that we committed the transaction? Should it be all of them? Should it be some of them? Right? So these are the things that, that we're, going to, we're going to worry about today. So... One important assumption we're going to make about this entire lecture is that we are going to assume that the software running on our nodes in our distributed database are our friends, meaning they'll be well behaved. They're not going to try to screw us over, right? They're, 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 it's software that we, we as the database system developer, software that we wrote uh, and that we've deployed under the same administrative domain. So if we ask a transaction, we ask a node to commit a transaction and they come back and say, yeah, we're going to commit that, we assume you know, uh, modulo hardware failure or, you know, a software bug, we assume if a node tells us they're going to commit a transaction, they will commit that transaction. And right? that's going to simplify in some ways how we're going to do our commit protocol. If you assume that the nodes could be bad actors, right, if they say, yeah, we committed that, we're going to screw you, we're not going to actually do that, then you don't need some of the things we'll talk about today. You actually need what is called a Byzantine fault tolerant protocol. And this is essentially what the blockchain is under Bitcoin. Right? A blockchain is, is essentially just a distributed database. Right? It's just a log where you, you append things with transactions. 
But in that environment, you assume, because it's Bitcoin mining, right, or whatever you're trying to do, that the, the participants in your distributed database are not your friend and they can lie to you. So you need a way to, to deal with that. We are not in that world. Most database systems, distributed database systems, are not in this world. Most distributed databases can assume that everybody is going to be uh, is going to play along correctly. Um, most people don't need a blockchain. Very few things need a blockchain. So if you think you're building something and you, and you use a blockchain, you <laughs> rethink your life. Okay. All right. So the things we're talking about today are listed here. So the other, I, I didn't say this last class, but I just want to sort of say it again. I'm trying to cover in three lectures what would normally be like an entire year of studying distributed databases. Um, so we can't obviously cover everything in detail. And I consider my goal here is to just to expose you to like the issues, the problems, the difficulties of, of building a distributed database, even using a distributed database system. So that you know, when you leave CMU and you go out in the real world, if you find yourself in a situation where you think you either need to use a distributed database or you think you want to build one, you should at least know what are the issues you should be thinking about and, and so you can reason about you know, whether you're doing the right thing. And I'll sort of say up front that most people probably don't need a distributed database. There are you know, obviously some, some useful cases, but I would say, I mean, I can't prove this, but 90% of the, of the world's databases can run on a single box. Now, you probably should have replication, and once you bring that in, that becomes a distributed database. But most of the times, you don't need a partition database. Most workloads can handle, be handled on a single box. Right? All right, so... Uh, Let's we'll talk about atomic commit protocols, how to get everyone to agree that we're going to commit, how do we handle replication to make sure that we ha have multiple copies of our data so that we can always stay online. Then we'll get into the cat theorem, talk about consistency issues, how do we, you know, what kind of guarantees can a distributed database uh, uh, provide for us given our, our, our commit protocol. And then if we have time at the end, we'll quickly talk about federated databases, just the idea of composing disparate databases together and to make a single database instance. Okay? All right, so that example I showed in the beginning of when we went to go ahead and commit the transaction, and then the, the one node had to talk to the other nodes and say, hey, is it safe to commit? This is what is called an atomic commit protocol. And the idea here is that we want to get everyone's feedback that participated in our transaction to decide whether it's OK to commit that transaction. And then if, if one node or enough nodes, depending what protocol you're using, if a certain amount of nodes above the threshold that we're going to define in our protocol all agree that we should commit this transaction, then we tell everyone we will commit this transaction, and then it, then it becomes committed. So there's a bunch of different variants of, of an atomic commit protocol that you can use. So the two that we're going to focus on is two-phase commit and Paxos. Two-phase commit is probably the most prevalent one, right? It goes back into the 1980s. Paxos has certain guarantees that two-phase commit cannot provide. Um, some systems can use this, uh, but it's, this is sort of a degenerate case of this. There's also a three-phase commit. That was actually developed by Mike Stonebreaker, the guy who invented Postgres in the 1980s. No one actually ever does this. It's too, uh, there's too much, you know, too much network traffic. Um, there's actually a four-phase commit as well from Microsoft. They use in, in the, this distributed database called Farm. They have to do that because they're using RDMA, sort of special uh, remote memory access. Again, we're not going to cover that. Again, Paxos, we'll talk about. Raft is, was developed by Stanford about uh, 10 years ago as a more easily understood variant of Paxos, but it basically provides the same guarantees. Raft actually shows up a lot more often in newer distributed database systems because there's a lot of existing, or the, people basically wrote like libraft, right? They wrote libraries that implement Raft that people can then incorporate into uh, their database for a, a ton of different languages. Like there's no lib Paxos that everyone can use. Zab was developed uh, for Apache Zookeeper. And then view stamp replication is not that common, but this actually turned out to be the first provably correct atomic commit protocol. It actually came out before Paxos, but people didn't recognize the, the properties this thing had until Paxos came along uh, much later. So again, four distributed databases that are not the blockchain uh, that are actually you're probably going to encounter in the real world. You're most likely, you're most likely going to see two-phase commit or Paxos, and then for newer systems, probably wrap. But for this lecture, we'll just cover uh, those two there, uh, uh, two-phase commit and Paxos. So actually, quick show of hands. Who here has ever heard of two-phase commit before? All right, less than half. OK. So two-phase commit sounds exactly the way you know, it, it sounds, right? It's a two-phase commit protocol. It has two phases. So let's look at an example here where we're going to have everyone agree to commit a transaction. So assume at this point 
the application server has executed whatever queries that it wants to, to, to make changes on the database or read whatever data, data wants on, on, on our different nodes. And it wants to go ahead and commit. So it's going to send a commit message to this guy here. Assume this is the master node. So on their two-phase commit uh, vernacular, we are going to say this guy is going to be considered the coordinator. So it's in charge of asking around to its friends involved in the transaction whether it's allowed to commit this transaction. And then the other two nodes here we call participants. Now, I'm not going to show examples of this, but the node, the participant node itself could also be a participant, right? This, the, this node here could also have been modified by this transaction, and then it's involved in this two-phase commit process. But for simplicity, assume that this transaction here only modified data on the, on the, the two other nodes. So in the first phase, called the prepare phase, we send out a network message to our uh, participants, from the coordinator to participants, to ask them, hey, here's this transaction. We think you know about it. Is it OK to commit? And they're going to do whatever validation or whatever they need to do to determine whether this, this transaction is allowed to commit. And if they determine that it's OK, then they send back an OK message. Then now, once you get back the, the OKs from all the participants, the coordinator goes into the second phase, called the commit phase, where it tells the, all the participants, hey, good news, everybody said we can commit this transaction, go ahead and commit this. And then likewise, these guys now have to send a response to say, okay, we did that, this transaction is committed. And then at this point here, when we get back in the, in the second phase, the okays from all our participants, we can then go tell the outside world that our transaction has successfully committed. So there's one thing I'm not showing here, and I think that the textbook talks about this, is that at every step of the protocol, on every single node involved in it, we're writing out log messages to keep track of what messages we got and what, message, what, what responses we sent out. So at this point here, when I send, hey, we'll go ahead and commit this, these guys are going to write a log message and say, hey, for this transaction, I saw I got a, I entered the commit phase, and I said that was OK to do. Right? So that way, if we crash and come back, we would say, oh, we were involved in this transaction. How far in the two-phase commit process did we get to determine whether we need to undo it or redo it? And so another important distinction about this, and this will differ from Paxos in a few more slides, is that all of the nodes, all the participant nodes in the commit protocol for this transaction, they all have to say we have to commit this transaction. It's either everyone or no one. So we go to the, to the next example here of one where we have an abort. So again, same thing. My transaction finishes. I send the commit request to my coordinator. The coordinator enters the first phase, sends the prepare message to the two, the two participant nodes. But let's say this bottom guy here, for whatever reason, you know, for its concurrency to protocols, decides that we cannot commit this transaction. So it sends back an abort message. So as soon as the coordinator gets the first abort message from any of the participants, it is no longer in the prepare phase, and now it immediately goes into the next phase, in this case, we're for the abort. And so at this point, we can immediately go back to our, our client, our application, and say, hey, this transaction can't finish. We're going to abort. Even before we even go to the second phase, or even before we hear back from anybody else. One abort message will kill this entire thing. So now in the abort phase, we say, hey, we're, we're aborting this. And then everyone comes back and says, OK, we, we've aborted. And at this point, the, the, the transaction is done. So the idea is here that we need two network round trips to get everyone to agree that we're going to commit this transaction. And then we go ahead and, or commit or abort this transaction, and we go ahead and then apply that change. Yes? Do we really need the last part of the second round trip before we notify the application server? So this question, for, for the abort or commit, so the question is, do I need this second round here to tell the, the do I need to t go to the nodes here and say, yes, you've committed, before I tell the application or before I tell who? No, I'm saying that uh, do we really need to wait for the responses back that yes, we have committed before we tell the application? Because, because the prepare phase was okay, so we know that they will definitely come back. Right. So his question is, say I'm here. I'm in the prepare phase. This transaction should commit. I send my, I send my prepare request. These guys send back OK. Is, do I really need to wait for the next round trip to say, OK, go ahead and commit this and get here back from them before I can tell the application I need to commit? In practice, no. For absolute correctness, yes. Because like, if, I, if, I, if I crash at this point here, 
Right, it's, it's actually, it's, I take back. It, there's a trade-off between the time it takes to recover and the time it takes to, to, to send a response. So in, if I'm logging everything to disk, then you're right. As soon as I get back here, if I crash at this point here, I have my two OKs for my participants. I would have logged that to, in the coordinator. So now if I crash, I come back and I would say, 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 the, say the coordinator goes down, it would come back and look in the log and say, oh, well, I saw this thing, you know, I got these messages, did I commit or not? Okay, well, I make sure I, I, I apply to any exchanges. If one of these guys goes down, they would come back, but they, then they would, they would still need to know whether, you know, whether it actually truly committed for, before they could actually you know, redo everything. So for absolute correctness, yes. For performance, you don't have to do that. Yes? Um, in that case, do you have an issue if you crash before you send out the second commit and then you don't know whether or not you've actually sent a commit, like the success result was back to the server, so from the server's, like the application server's perspective, it might have like a phantom commit. All right, so this question is, if I'm here and then I send back, so I get I to this point. Everyone agrees that we're gonna commit. We're gonna write on disk in the coordinator that we've committed, that everyone agreed to commit. So therefore, we could enter the, the, the second phase and go actually go ahead and do the commit. But then I crash before, uh, and then I come back and I can reapply the change, and I didn't tell this guy he committed. So, that's, so that is actually not a guarantee that we can provide in our database system. It, it, this is true whether it's single node or distributed. So if we get to the point where everyone, where, you know, we flush the log to disk, we, everyone agreed that we're gonna commit, but then before we tell the outside world we've committed, We've crashed, and that network never doesn't go. That transaction is still considered to be committed, and it's up for the application code to then come back and figure out whether the, the request it asked actually committed or not. We can't guarantee that, right? Because how do we know, like least in this case here, that like this message could get could get lost? The app, the database server is, shouldn't be responsible for figuring that out. Yes. So for forks, do we care about having that okay message back, waiting for that? Or? Uh, for which one? Like for this one? For 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 the, the, this one, this, the second phase, no, because again, it's just like just like when we aborted the transaction uh, on a single node. As soon as I know it's, I, I'm aborted, why wait to flush any CLRs or anything out the disk? I just tell the outside world immediately you aborted, and who cares, right? Because that's it's as if the transaction never executed, so we tell it right away. Do you have a question or no? Okay. So uh, actually, related to his question. Uh, earlier about the comment, like, do I really need to wait for the OKs before I tell the outside world that I committed? This is, this is actually two of the optimizations you can actually do to sort of speed up the protocol at, in exchange for having a longer recovery time. Uh, well, that, that, that's the second one here. That's what he proposed. So the first optimization you can do is called early prepare voting. So this would be where if I know that my, my, my application is, is sending the last query that it's ever going to execute to one of the participant nodes, then in addition to, it, to me sending the query, I also piggyback another message that says, oh, by the way, I'm never coming back to you to ask you to do anything else, so go ahead and send me your response as if we were, as if we were in the prepare phase for two-phase commit. So now it's one network message to execute the query and run, run the prepare phase, and then my response, I get the, I get the result of that query plus the, the result of the prepare check. So this obviously requires you to know in the application server that you're never going to go back and, and run another query on, the, on, on, that, uh, on that node. What he was proposing is the, uh, it was called early acknowledgement after prepare. So once you know and on the coordinator that everyone agrees that we're going to commit this transaction, then you can immediately tell the outside world your transaction is committed and then you take care of the, of the commit phase. So again, just visually, it's like this. I do commit, prepare phase, everyone votes that it's OK. And then now at this point, once I get my two responses from my participants, I can go ahead and tell the application I, I committed. And the idea here is that the likelihood that I'm going to crash for this round trip here is low. So therefore, I, it's OK for me to go ahead and, and do this. If I now crash during this, you know, say, before I hear back from this or before I hear back from these, then I have to do extra work to figure out whether I truly actually committed and resolve the thing correctly, but th that's okay. Yes? If other participants are prepared to commit, they've already logged the commit locally. This question is, if a transaction, if we're in this phase here, in prepare, I get my prepare message, participant says, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and commit this. 
Your question is, what are they logged at this point? So, like, if I send you a page of my coordinator that I'm prepared to submit, yes. and they send me another one that goes to submit, yes. and crash. Yes. But I already do the early acknowledgement that I logged to the schedule. Yes. But the question is going to crash. Is it actually? Okay, so his question is, so I'm here. Uh, I, I send back my OK. I tell the application, OK, you've had, you go ahead and committed. But now this participant crashes. In the log, it says, I told the coordinator I, I, I was going to commit. What do I do when I come back? Well, this you assume the coordinator would know, all right, well, this guy crashed. Now he comes back. And in my, in my, in my log here, I would, I would then say, all right, well, I saw commits from everyone. This transaction should commit. So you would, you would have the coordinator fill in the missing information as needed on, on the participant, participant when it comes back up. Okay, so the, the coordinator would then see like, oh, node 2 sent me the OK that they're prepared to commit, but they never sent me the OK that they commit. Right, so you, you would get here the commit message, and then that would, that would never show up. So, th so then it dies. So this requires you to have, so we're not going to talk about this. This is more distributed systems uh, stuff, but it, and it's, we, we care about that. We need it here. So this one you can use like a heartbeat just to keep track of like is the note up to have this thing determine whether like I, I haven't heard back from him in a while go into some recovery mode or failure mode to, to, to handle that case. Yeah. Yes. So why don't we just send the success to application after we get okay after the phase two? Sorry, so your question is why do we why do we send the why don't we after the, the okay it comes from this phase two? So that's what I showed in the original. So the question is, why are we not sending the success message after the commit phase? Yeah. Yeah. So that's like the the original two phase commit protocol. That's how it works, right? But think about it. again. I'm not saying also where these nodes are located. Could be in the same rack in the same data center. Could be across the world. So rather than me waiting for this the next round trip, which could be 100 milliseconds, maybe longer, I'll just go ahead and send the hey your transaction committed. Because I assume that I'm not going to crash during this time. And I have the recovery me mechanisms that are necessary to then handle the fair, fair scenario that he mentioned to recover myself if I come back after a crash. Yes? Um, in the time between it starts receiving like uh, instructions and uh, like a, in the time between a participant starts receiving instructions and the time it receives prepare, like can it keep all of that change in memory because it doesn't actually need to flush anything out to disk up until then? So your question is, if, if you're here, uh, so you've told the outside world, you've told the coordinator you want to you want to commit. What is actually what is this node actually doing? Could you just keep everything in memory? Yeah, before it receives prepare, because like essentially, it's a, since the, it can just throw everything away up until then, until it receives prepare, then it needs to actually get everything out on this, except for like the actual like commitness. Yeah. So his, his question is, instead of I'm being vague here, but like in the original two phase commit protocol, like I I logged a disk, then send my response, but nobody does that. Right? So in theory, you could just buffer the log messages. If it gets flushed out as a group, part of group commit, who cares? But I know that if I crash to come back, and maybe some of those log records that told me what I was, how I voted for committing this transaction get lost, I could come back and the coordinator would have, could, could put me up, get me up to speed where I, let, you know, fill in the missing details that, that I lost. Yeah, you could do that as well. Yeah, I don't think anybody does the hardcore, like flush every log record on every single node, every single time. Nobody, do, nobody does that, so at least as far as I know. OK. So just to, to reiterate everything we talked about today. So the, as I said, the, the, the nodes can, can record what happens in each phase and what messages they receive, what messages they send out to, to a log. Um, and that allows them to fill in the missing details when you come back after a crash. So if we're in, while we're running our transaction and the coordinator crashes before we tell that, you know, before we resolve what actually happened, uh, it's up for the participants to decide how, to the, how they want to proceed. So the simplest thing to do is like if the coordinator goes down, assume the transaction aborts and we just, you know, you roll back any changes. But you could have the participants recognize, oh, our coordinator is down and our transaction's still open. So somebody could become the new coordinator and then figure out how everyone voted, and then decide whether you want to commit that transaction or not. Yes? Um, about the first option that you used, like, so like, if this coordinator crashes and everyone starts to work, what if the coordinator crashes out of 10 minutes? What if the coordinator crashes? 
So her question is, what, what if we're here uh, and say this guy sends the commit message, it arrives at node two, but before it can send the other one to node three, it crashes, what happens, right? So again, the first option is I, uh, if, I, if we can recognize the coordinator crash, whether it's a heartbeat or a timeout or whatever, we just say, oh, this, we had this open transaction, we're gonna abort. But at this point, we've told, once we t the coordinator says one, one node, hey, this transaction is committed, that is the, the, the ground truth of what actually happened. So it's now it's up for this node to then co coordinate with everyone else or tell everyone else, hey, this transaction, I, the, the coordinator said I transaction committed, we should actually go ahead and commit this, right? Again, this is why I'm saying that like, we, this, this doesn't work if our nodes are malicious. It only works that like everyone's on, on, you know, playing on the same team. So we hear, we hear one commit message uh, from this guy and that should be enough to, to validate everyone else and tell them, yes, we should commit this. Okay, so then now if a participant crashes, so for this one, again, under two-phase commit, we just assume that the participant is gone and we replace their missing response with just an abort and we go ahead and abort the transaction. Right, that's sort of the simplest thing to do. So the key thing to point out here, what's happening is that the nodes have to block until they find out what's supposed to happen. And the way, you know, to avoid blocking forever, you just have a sort of a timeout, but how long you set that, you know, can vary depending on the operating environment. You just have a timeout to say, all right, I haven't heard anything about this for a certain amount of time, so we get, we go ahead and abort this transaction. So you could have a, you know, live lock issue or an issue where like, you're just not making any forward progress because your nodes are sitting around and waiting. So an alternative to two-phase commit, two-phase commit is probably, Certainly any distributed database built in the 1980s and 90s is going to be using two-phase commit. Uh, the newer ones can use variants of two-phase commit or could use Paxos or Raft. Um, two-phase commit is a, you know, is a sort of a subset or generative case of, of Paxos. And you, so hopefully it makes sense when, when we go through it. So with Paxos, it comes from the distributed computing world. So instead of calling this an atomic commit protocol, they'll call this a consensus protocol. But the idea is the same. You're trying to get a bunch of nodes to agree that this is the correct behavior, this is the correct change to our state machine. So what's going to happen is under Paxos is that you're going to have a coordinator propose whether transactions are allowed to commit, and then a bunch of participants are going to vote whether it's going to su succeed or not, whether that transaction is allowed to commit. But under Paxos, we only need a majority of the nodes to agree that commit to a transaction. In two-phase commit, we need all of them. Right? So now what happens is that as long as you have a majority of nodes uh, agreeing to commit a transaction, you don't have to block the entire system or block the entire uh, protocol. You can still make forward progress. Whereas, again, two-phase commit, you would have uh, one, one, having one participant become unavailable blocks the whole thing. So Paxos, the story of Paxos is, 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 is quite interesting. So the, the first description of Paxos is in this paper written by Leslie Lamport, who won the Turing Award a few years ago, called The Part-Time Parliament. Um, so I think this paper is dated, it says 1998, but he actually invented it in, two, in 1992. And what he was trying to do, he was trying to come up with a, a proof by contradiction of an example that shows you couldn't have a consensus protocol with, with this fault tolerance property. And they end up in the process of, of actually inventing one. So if you ever read this paper, it's the craziest thing because it's, it's written as if he's like an archaeologist and he finds, he goes to this Greek island of Paxos and he finds uh, this, these stone tablets and he derives what the actual, the algorithm is from these ancient civilization. Like it's not like a computer science paper. It's all like this, 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 this uh, illustrative story. So the story goes is that he wrote this paper in 92 with all this like uh, the Greek island stuff. The reviewers hated the story and wanted him to put, you know, rewrite it to make it more computer science-y. He refused and he didn't make any change. So he, he retracted the paper, put it in his, his, uh, his filing cabinet. It didn't touch it for like six or seven years until people started publishing papers that looked a little bit like Paxos. So then he pulled it out and says, aha, you're, you're all way off or you're close, but I've, I've already solved this problem. So that's, what, that's the story you get when you read it from Leslie Lamport's website. When I was in grad school, one of my, uh, I took a class from Maurice Herlihy, the guy that invented linearizability, um, transactional memory. He used to be a professor here, here at CMU. And he said, he was actually the, one of the reviewers of this paper. 
And he said they were the, the they were okay back in 1992 with all the Greek island story. They just wanted him to add, add an appendix with just an algorithm to show what the thing actually was and like a you know, brief description of it. And Leslie Lamport was so stubborn. He didn't want, he thought the paper was so perfect. He didn't want to change anything. Um, so, but it, it's an interesting paper. You should definitely go read it. Uh, it's a, it's probably, if you read, you, you read, read this for amusement, you're not going to learn anything from it. At least I didn't. Um, and then he has a follow-up paper called Paxos Made Simple. That doesn't help either. Um, it's the Google one, Paxos Made Live. For me, that was the one that actually it clicked. And now I understand what the protocol actually was. So, Let's go through a brief example. So for this, we're now going to introduce a, an additional node, right? Because we need to have a, a voting majority. Um, and then the difference is going to be now when we get a commitment request under the Paxos parlance, instead of under two-base commit, we have a coordinator. Paxos calls this a proposer. And then instead of participants, they're going to call it acceptors. So this, the, the proposer is going to say, hey, we want to go ahead and commit this transaction. Is that going to be OK? So now let's say in our example here, this middle node here crashes and goes down. So now the first two nodes come back and says, yes, we agreed to go ahead and, and commit this. So under Paxos, we just need a majority. So two out of three nodes in this example here agree to commit this transaction. So that's enough. That's enough for us to go ahead and, and try to commit this. On our two-phase commit, if this guy goes down, we, we'd have to abort the whole thing. So now we get the, the majority to agree. We go ahead and commit, and they come back and say, yes, we accept to make that commit. And then now we have to send back our success message. So we actually, for this one, we have to wait until we get that, the second phase response back. We can't shortcut it in the way you can in two-phase commit. Because we actually could come back and get rejected in, in the second phase. So let's look at a different example. Let's look at it in terms of a timeline here. So let's say at the exact same time, there's two different proposers in our distributed database. And so the first guy is going to say, hey, I want to keep with this transaction. And sort of think of what they're really doing in the state machine. They're just appending a log message and say, here's the change we made. The state machine is the database. So they're proposing that this transaction should commit, and therefore its changes should be applied to the database. So I'm moving the state forward. So it says, I want to commit the change for at timestamp n. So it goes all to the acceptors. Right? And then they come back and say, yes, we're, we agree to go ahead and commit this change. But now this other proposer comes along and says, I have this other transaction that made a change, and its timestamp is n plus 1. So it's a logical timestamp. So now what will happen is, if the, this guy comes back and says, hey, I want to commit n, because you guys all agreed to commit this, so let's go ahead and commit this, they're going to reject it because they saw n plus 1. So even though they don't know what the outcome of n plus 1 is going to be, just the mere fact of seeing a new proposal for committing a transaction or changing the state of the database, that requires them to all abort or reject the, the one they all agreed to before. So then now we send the agreement to commit n plus 1. And then he goes says, all right, great, let's go commit n plus 1. And then once we all accept this, then uh, at this point here, the transaction is actually committed. Yes? Her question is, yeah, so it's, it's her question, basically asking, what is this n? And so if I come along with n minus 1, would that be, be immediately rejected? Yes. Now, how you actually have a logically, you know, a, a, a globally uh, valid timestamp or counter that everyone agrees to go, you know, go up in the correct order so that I can always move forward in time. The simple way to do that is you assume your clocks are reasonably in sync. Uh, and you, you, could, you could append a, a logical counter to it, maybe prefix the host name so that you can break ties. Right, there's standard tricks to, to, to handle this. Yes? Right, so her question is, couldn't this go forever? In theory, could, couldn't these two proposers just keep clobbering each other back and forth? Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll handle that next slide. Yes? So your question is, does it matter if there's, say, say it again, there's a majority of acceptors or? No, of the set. So like you have five machines, yes. three of them are Except accept proposal from one, three of them are getting proposal from the other, there's one machine that's getting proposal from both. How, 
How would that work? Yeah, so if one guy, if one of these acceptors sees n plus 1, they have to reject n. Yeah. I think they cover Paxos in, in the distributed systems class, right? The guy, you actually have to implement it. So I'm, I'm, being, I'm going through this very briefly just to show the distinction between two-phase commit and, and Paxos that, like, you know, the, the, I, 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 the high-level idea is the same, except that under two, Paxos, you know, you still get rejected in the second phase, and the, you have a majority you have to agree. So now, her question is, or her observation is, in, couldn't I get starred forever if I just have two proposers clobbering each other by proposing, you know, n plus 1, n plus 2, n plus 3, and everything just keeps getting rejected? Absolutely. So the way you handle this is called multi-paxos. So the idea with multi-paxos is that you, you select some node to become the leader for your paxos group, and then it's the sole node responsible for, for proposing changes to commit transactions. Right? It's the one that, like, think of this, it's delegated or designated as the, almost like the coordinator or the, 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 the middleware piece that everything, everybody has to go to to determine whether they're allowed to commit or not. And it, it, you have a lease on being designated as a leader, like, you know, some 60 seconds or so. And then after that 60 seconds is up, you do a, a round of voting, which is another, another round of Paxos, to determine who the next leader is going to be. And then once that, that's resolved, then you go ahead and have, you know, that, that new designated leader be the responsible for all, uh, for applying all the changes. So this, this avoids that, that starv starving issue because the leaders would be the only one proposing the changes. Yes? Correct. So she's like, isn't just moving the problem because now can you get starved for the leader election, right? So... Again, we assume our nodes are friendly, so we just have right in our, in our database system where you say, all right, well, the, after my lease is over, I'll try to be the only one to, 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 to you know, vote myself or propose that I, I can be the new leader. How do you handle two guys calling at the same time? Yes, but you, you sort of back off. So I, I tried, I got rejected, so instead of me immediately trying to reject or immediately trying to propose something new, maybe I'll wait 10 milliseconds. If I propose again, I get rejected, maybe I'll wait 20 and just you know, do it that way. Yes? How many proposers do you have? The question is, how many proposers can you have? As many as you want. The algorithm doesn't say anything about, about a limitation. In practice, it's like, again, for a, they'll call it a Paxos group. Uh, you typically would have one under multi Paxos to avoid this star, starvation issue. If we cover Spanner at the end of the semester of the system puppery, which every year we always do, uh, I'll show you how you can do Paxos with that. Question over here? Okay. So, the, the main takeaway from this is that, so with, with two-phase commit and Paxos, you can both use them to commit transactions, to determine whether everyone agrees we want to go ahead and commit transactions. In practice, usually, for distributed databases that are local to each other, like meaning they're running in the same data center, where they're not like, you know, over widespread geographic regions, Two-phase commit is what people mostly use because the, the number of round trips uh, could be less. And you assume that maybe the nodes aren't going aren't to be uh, crashed as often. Again, there's much extra failure scenario code you have to, you have to deal with, failure handling code to deal with, like, you know, the coordinator goes down, participant goes down. So it's, you know, even though it would be slightly faster than Paxos, it's still, there's still much stuff you have to do to make sure that you don't, the whole system doesn't go down and you don't lose data. And as I said before, the, the inventor of Paxos, Leslie Lamport, and Jim Gray, the guy who invented two-phase locking, they had a paper in the early 2000s, before Jim disappeared, um, that showed that uh, two-phase commit is a degenerative case of two-phase locking, right? Just sort of think of like, or sorry, not, degenerative case of Paxos, right? The, the coordinator, it, it's the same Paxos round of, 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 of voting, it's just everyone has to agree rather than the majority, okay? So let's talk about replication now. As I said in the beginning, most people don't need a sort of a partition distributed database to handle the workload. Uh, most of the databases you probably encounter in the real world will probably be using you know, rep, some kind of replication. And I would say that still counts as, as a distributed database. So the idea here in a distributed database, or sorry, replicated re with replication, is that we want to make multiple copies of every object, whether it's a page or a tuple or a table, whatever you want, 
and store them on multiple nodes so that if one of those nodes goes down, we have a backup available for us. So we don't have to wait for the system to reboot and replay the log to put us back in the correct state. We could just fail over using Paxos to decide who, who to fail over to uh, to determine what becomes the, you know, the, the new location for writing data. So there's a bunch of design decisions we have to think about when we want to build our replication scheme. So we're, we'll go through each of these one by one. So the first, first issue is what, how are we actually going to uh, configure the system, configure the replicas in the systems, and where do the reads and writes go to? So the most common approach is use what is called master replica uh, replication, sometimes called, called leader follower. Uh, used to be called master slave, but people try to, uh, try to avoid that term. And the idea here is that there's some designated master uh, for, that, for, for a given object in the database. And all the writes are going to go to that master, master node. And the master node is then responsible for propagating those changes, the updates, to its replicas. And all the reads can go either to the master or some systems that can also go to the replicas so you can offload the work you have to do in the master because the writes could be, could be very expensive. And so as I said, if, if now the master goes down, then we hold a Paxos round to do a leader election to determine which replica becomes the new master. And that's where all the writes go to. Question? Then will this system have eventual consistency? His question is, will this system have eventual consistency? No. We'll get there. Not necessarily. Like, this will definitely not be consistent. No, 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 not true. A few more slides. OK. The other approach is to multi-master where we have uh, replicas stored in different machines, and transactions are allowed to, to write to any of those replicas, right? sometimes, sometimes called multi-home. And then now it's, the repl replicas are responsible for, for determining if you have two transactions that try to update the same thing, running the two different replicas, how do you actually coordinate for, to decide which one should actually commit, which one should abort? How do you actually deal with conflicts? So let's look at these visually. Again, master, master replica. You have, a, you have a master node. All your writes go to this guy. And in and, and some systems, all the reads go here as well. And then this just then propagates over the network the, the, the update information to, to, it, to its replicas so that it can get applied. And then for some systems, you, again, you can have the reads go to the replicas so that you reduce the amount of work you're doing on the front end. So if your reads don't need to have the most up-to-date latest information, then you can offload them to, to these other guys here. Right? This will still be potentially consistent, right? meaning like I can if I have snapshot isolation, I can be guaranteed that I'm not seeing torn updates or partial updates from transactions still running on, on this guy here. So I still can guarantee the consistency of the data I'm reading on my replicas. It just may be the case that I'm not seeing the, the latest information that's on the master. The multi-master approach is that, again, we have transactions, can do reads and writes to any copy of the data, and then there's some uh, procedure to resolve the conflict, again, using Paxos or two-phase commit to decide, you know, to have, to have overlapping changes on these two replicas, what should be the latest version. So just as, as a quick antidote, Facebook originally used to use this, this uh, uh, master replica setup for their giant data center, right? The, the main data center was, I think, you know, in California, um, and then across the different, around the world, they would have replicas that would follow along the, the, you know, the, 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 the master and get updates to, you know, to propagate the changes so that you could see things. And the way they would fake it out to make it look like your changes happened real fast locally, like if you updated your timeline, uh, they would store that as a cookie information in your browser so that if you refresh the page, you would see your update, even though it had, may not been propagated to the, to the replica where you're reading your timeline from. Right, because it takes a bit of delay for the write to show up here and then to get pushed out to the replica. And now, probably five, six years ago, now they do the, the multi-master multi setup. So an important concept in our, uh, uh, with replica, yes? You mentioned that they store the objects, the data into the cache of the problem. Yeah, correct. So, so, so there's a, there's a there's a lot of public information about this for years ago. So the way, like if I write a post, like, a, a, you know, in my timeline, if I refresh the page, and if, I, and if I'm, say I'm in Brazil, and I'm reading the Brazil, I, you know, my local data center has, is a replica of the master. Yeah. So now if I refresh my page and come back, I wouldn't see my post because it hasn't been propagated from the master to the replica, because there's, there's, there's always a delay for this. 
So people would then, you, they want to avoid the issue of someone posting in their, their timeline, hitting refresh, and then thinking their, their post went missing because now you're reading from this, right? So the way they would handle that is they would actually store what you wrote in, in your browser cookie and then fill that in as if it was coming from the database. Oh, but actually it's not. It's not. If, if the user now, I mean, in just one second or less, they quit their browser. Yes. Then the cookie is gone. If they quit their browser and assuming the cookies got, got blown away, yeah, yeah. and you cut, oh, it's, it's, it's put even better scenario. I, I make a change in my timeline on this machine, and I have another machine right next to it. And then I hit refresh on that machine, it would go to the replica database down in Brazil. It would not see your post. Yeah. You know, it'd, it'd be a couple, you know, 100 milliseconds before it actually got propagated. But they would say, you know, what's the likelihood of someone going to hit refresh on two machines at the exact same time? Yes? Correct. So, so your question is, does that, in my scenario with, with Facebook, if, if the replica is Brazil, this is in California, when I actually did the post, does that mean the application server needs to communicate with the, the database back in California from Brazil? Yes. That's a huge so statement is that's a huge bottleneck. Absolutely. And that's why they did the cookie thing to hide it. Because doing this, is, is, this is hard. Right? They had to build that. And, and, and to get that right is not easy. Yes. His question is, or same is, it, again, using the, that, the Facebook example, if someone comments on that post, I will never see that. No, because again, it's just the deal with you as the person writing the post. If you hit refresh, it, it, would, it would pull it from the cookie so that you would think you got it from, from the master, but you really got it from the replica. It fills in the missing information that knows it should exist for you. Eventually, it, the, the master will get propagated to the replica, and then now if I do a refresh, instead of coming from the cookie, I'll come from my replica. So if someone posts my comment, I, there'll be a delay before I, I can see it. All comments also go to the California master. Correct. In the, in, the old, in the old system, yes. In the new system, yes. Everything is... Now we're getting into GPDR world, which I don't want to get into. Like, where can data actually live? Uh, but in, in general, you think of yes. Like, think of this as like Brazil, America, US. Everyone has a complete copy of the entire database. Whether Facebook actually does that anymore, I don't know. Again, just think, think of this as, so this is a good example of, it's sort of like MP3s, right? MP3s take advantage of, of us as humans of what we can perceive in, in audio, and they, they, they can compress down you know, wavelengths that we can't see. Right? It throws away data that we, the humans are never going to be able to hear to compress the, the, you know, the, the actual file. So it's sort of like the same thing, right? They know that if it takes me 100 milliseconds to get, to get a, from a, a comment on, on my post, get from the master the replica, who cares if it takes me 100 milliseconds to see your comment about my stupid picture, right? The thing they were trying to avoid was someone posting and then immediately not seeing what they posted. So that's why they're doing that cookie trick. But it, for everything else, you just have to wait till it gets propagated. And again, if it's 100 milliseconds to see a comment from, from your friend, who cares? Yes? Presumably now that they're doing multi-master, like your data is being stored, but they probably want to keep it like the master for your data is the one in Brazil if you're a Brazilian user. And if you're in California, the master for your data is in the California. They're trying to get this like close view as possible. And then like in the comment, like in the comment use case, someone in California comments on like my post in Brazil or something like yes. that. Yes. Then all of a sudden that has to be coordinated across all the way down to Brazil. Yes. So, so just re repeat his comment. Like for this one, I'm showing P1, the partition P1. And I'm assuming everyone has a complete copy of this. But now you can think of like, uh, in a really large, large distributed database with a lot of data, I'm gonna maybe maybe want to replicate P1 multiple times, so there could be multiple copies of P1. Uh, and so maybe if all my data is down in, if I'm down in Brazil, then I'll keep more copies of my data in, in down in Brazil because I can update them more quickly if anybody's posting my comment in Brazil. Now, if anybody updates something in California, that has to then get propagated down to Brazil, so that, so that when I refresh, I can see it. Yes, they, they handle all that. Yeah, the Facebook architecture actually, I mean, it's, it's, it's all based on MySQL as, at the, end, at the, the, as the, the, the core storage engine of their giant distributed database system is, is MySQL. They're getting rid of InnoDB and eventually replacing with RocksDB, um, but all the layers above that are sort of independent of what the actual underlying storage is, what the actual storage system is. Like all that coordination stuff of like keeping the multi-master multi stuff in sync, that's all written by Facebook. 
All right, so an important uh, property we care about in, in, in a replicated environment is this notion of case safety. And the idea here is just keeping track of the number of copies of an object we have to have in order for our system to remain online. So I, I don't know whether case safety is a st standardized term. This is something that M Mike Stonebreaker uh, uses when describing Vertica and VoltDB. And basically, it's a, it's a human-defined threshold to say, I need to have at least k copies of a particular object at all time in my distributed database. And if I ever go below that k, then I grind the system to a halt, and I stop until either I can bring up a new, new copy of that data, or you know, user, uh, the human comes in and makes a correction. And the idea here is, is that we want to avoid losing data. So obviously, I want my k safety be, to be at least one, right? Because if I have, if I lose one, you know, if I lose one node that has the only copy of that of a piece of data, then I'm screwed. Now I could have false negatives or false positives for, for different queries, and my database is incorrect. So what this threshold actually is depends on you know how paranoid you are about uh, keeping things online. And then you can also you know vary this by saying like in my example like I have more copies down in Brazil, maybe one copy up in up in, in you know in the U.S. because I want to make you know I, I care about keeping local copies down in Brazil. All right, so now we want to get into what what are we actually propagating or how we're actually propagating our changes to to our replicas. And he sort of asked about this like is, does this mean we're doing eventual consistency? And I, my answer was no, and we'll see why. So. The propagation team is 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 when should we? How long do we have to wait, or how many? When should we tell the outside world that our transaction has committed? And this is somewhat independent of the two-phase commit stuff, right? This is saying like, with my replicas, should I wait until the replica acknowledges that they got my change and have have safety safety stored in the disk before I tell the outside world that I've actually committed? And in general, the two approaches are to do synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous will give you what's called strong consistency, which means I can guarantee that if I tell the outside world my transaction has committed, if I go read that data from any replica, I'm guaranteed to see the changes of that transaction. With eventual consistency, the idea is that the change will eventually get propagated to my replicas. So if I go, if I, if I get, hear back my transaction is committed, and I immediately go try to read it on a replica, I may not actually see it. So again, look at this visually. So with synchronous, we have, say, two nodes. Assuming we're doing a, a, a master replica setup, we, we say we want to commit on, the, on our master, and then we have to go to the, uh, to the replica and say, hey, you know, we, we sent you a bunch of log messages or a bunch of updates about this transaction made. Go ahead and flush it. And then we pause and we wait until we hear a response back from our replica to say that our transaction has, has successfully been committed and is durable on disk. And then once it's done, it's done flushing, we send back the acknowledgement, and at that point, we can tell the outside world that we've committed. So again, at this point here, when we get back this acknowledgement, if we try to read whatever this thing modified, we're guaranteed to see that change uh, correct, you know, see that the change we'd expect on both the master and, and any replica. With asynchronous, you don't wait for that response. So I go ahead and say I want to commit. Then I say, hey, go, go ahead and, and flush the change. But then I can immediately come back into the application and say, my transaction has committed. And then now, at some later point, you know, uh, this thing will eventually get flushed, but I don't really need to be told on the master. Be nice to know, but I, technically, I don't have to be told. So this is one of the good distinctions between the distributed database, sorry, the, the, the sort of traditional transactional relational database management systems and the NoSQL guys. In a, in a transactional database system, we don't want to lose any data. We don't want to have any in inconsistent reads. So we would always do synchronous replication. The, no, the NoSQL guys would do this one here. Because the idea is that eventually this thing will get propagated to my replicas. And so maybe in a small window, like 50 milliseconds, I can maybe get a stale read on my replica. That's, who cares? Right? It's a website of like stupid cat, fit, cat photos with comments. Who cares if I go, you know, I can't see the last 50 milliseconds of cat, cat comments. It's probably, probably good enough. If I have money, certainly I, I want to use this. Right, because what could happen here? I tell, my transaction commits, I tell the outside world I committed, but then this guy crashes and this guy crashes, and say this guy didn't flush anything to the disk, and this guy didn't get the, uh, get the message yet, or didn't apply it, now when I come back, my transaction's gone. So as, as an aside comment, I'll say that uh, 
a lot of the, the NoSQL, sorry, the NoSQL systems from 10 years ago that all said we, we were a shoe SQL, they were going to avoid joins, avoid transactions. A majority of them have added transactions, a majority of them have, have added SQL and joins. Right? So all the, 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 I mean, it's not to say that certain aspects of NoSQL systems are invalid. Uh, there are certainly use cases, like websites, we don't really need to have strong consistency. But in general, I mean, th there's enough applications out there where this, this, this matters a lot because you don't want to lose any data. Can you explain how you lost that transaction? So, so let's say, like, if I get this commit message here, and I immediately come back and say acknowledgement, and I don't log anything here. Actually, see, even if I did log something, right? Say I logged a disk that we committed this transaction. But now this, this machine catches on fire, those disks melt. I, so now this, this guy crashes too. But he just crashed and he comes back. He looks in his log. He didn't get the flush message because that didn't show up in time. So I told the outside world I committed, but this guy never saw the change and I crashed. So I come back now the transaction's gone. And if, that, and if that's your bank account with that money transfer, you're pissed. Right? So it's up to the application to decide what trade-offs they want to make. Do they care about now, are you super uh, conservative and don't want to lose any data? Then synchronous replication is the way to go. Uh, if you're okay with maybe losing the last 10, 5, you know, 50 milliseconds of data, then this is the way to go. Okay. The next issue is when do we actually when do we actually send send our, send our changes, and what do these changes actually look like? So one approach is to have the master continuously send all the updates that transactions make as they occur. Think of this as like it's, it's, like a, it's attached to the write-ahead log. So anytime I create a log record that I'm going to, you know, I want to write out the disk, I also send it out in the network to my, to my, to my replicas. And they can start applying the changes a, as they come in. Of course, this means now, I, not only do I need to send a commit message, but I also need to send an abort message, just as, just as I would if I'm replaying the write-ahead log, because I need to know what changes I need to roll back. The other approach is to only send the uh, log messages when a transaction actually goes into commit. So we just buffer all our, our, our log messages in memory on the master node. Then if we get abort, who cares? We just drop it. We don't send, it, send anything over the network. If we go ahead and commit, then we push everything to, to our, our master. Or sorry, to, to our replica. Right, and the advantage of this one is that you're not wasting time sending log messages that are going to get aborted from transactions that are going to abort. Uh, but of course, this means now if, if I need to, if I'm doing synchronous replication and I need to wait until this guy acknowledges that the replica acknowledges that it's applied all its changes, then if I'm sending this huge batch of updates all at once, I have to wait till they all get flushed. Whereas in this one, I can do it incrementally. So as far as I know, most systems will do do the first one here. All right, the last one's a bit more nuanced, uh, but it's, 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 what, it, it's determining how we're actually going to apply, or what are these changes we're actually going to apply to the system on our replicas. And so, again, in distributed databases, a lot of times the terminology is vague, or people use different things, or describe different things. Um, but I think active passive versus active active is standardized enough that this makes sense. I don't know, I don't know whether the textbook covers this. So think of this as like with active active, the idea is that our transaction is going to run independently on, uh, on each of our replicas. So say we have, a, we have a transaction that wants to update four tuples. We're going to run that transaction on the master and run that transaction on the replica. Or if we're doing multi-master, again, it runs on each, each, each copy of, of, the, of the node. And so they're going to when they commit, all we need to do to determine whether we've committed correctly is that we just need to check to see whether they all produce the same, same result. Now, this is not easy to do if you're doing a non-deterministic coherence control scheme, like two-phase locking and, and, and you know, uh, time state ordering, all the things we talked about before, because now you need to be guaranteed that the transactions are running in the same order on our, our two replicas without checking for every single query. So we talked a little bit about, about the partition timestamp ordering scheme uh, when Prashant talked that, taught that lecture. In that case, that's a you can use that for deterministic concurrency control to guarantee that you know transactions run their operations in the exact same order on both sides. So active-active is not that common. 
because uh, you have to do vector extra stuff to make sure that like they run exactly the same. What is more common is active passive, where the transaction is going to execute on one location, the one master node, and then they're going to propagate their changes to the replicas. And these these changes could either be like the write ahead log. You know, we we can either send out the the physical updates to the actual uh, tuples themselves or the bytes, the little, little bytes we changed. Or we could also stream out the, the SQL queries that they did and just replay the SQL queries on our replicas. Um, there's advantages of both of them, just as we talked about before, between you know, for the recovery time. Physical replication is usually the most common because all you're really doing is just sending out the, lo the right-ahead log messages and then the, the replicas replay them. So is this clear? Yes? Sending the SQL queries itself, then isn't it active-active? Because you are executing the transaction on the other side, right? His question is, if you send the, yeah, his statement is, when, yeah, I actually would agree with that. His statement is, if you're sending the SQL queries, isn't that the same thing as uh, as as active-active? I'm thinking in the terms of active-passive, where I run the SQL query on the on the, the master, and then the log message comes over and has the SQL query. Active-active, in the context of stored procedures, think of like two transactions running in their entirety independently on the two replicas. But in your example, yeah, I, that, this is why I'm saying the terms are like nebulous. I would agree that would be active-active, even though it's, it's done after. Like active-passive, as I, I run it on the master, and then only after I run on the master, then I send it to the replica. But you could, you could say, all right, I'm going to run this query, and then right before you run it on the master, you, you send it over to the, to the replica. Is that active-active? Eh, I would agree, yes. All right, um, we have like eight minutes left. Uh, and this is like one of the hardest things. <laughs> Let's roll the dice. Let's see if we can do it, okay? So there's this thing called the cat theorem that people apply for distributed databases. And this is a way to characterize and understand what are the properties or guarantees that a distributed database can provide for you. Um, and it's broken up to three parts. Consistency or consistent, always available, and network partition tolerant. So this was this was originally proposed as a conjecture by a Berkeley professor named Eric Brewer in the late 1990s, and then it was formally proved at MIT that this is actually correct. This is this is a true theorem uh, in 2002. And the basic idea is that of these three things, if you're going to have a distributed, distributed database, you you have to pick two of these. You can get two out of three, right? It, it, it's sort of like if you want. It's like, you know, uh, if you're looking for a husband or a wife, you can pick someone who's either smart, good looking, or not crazy, but you can get, you can get two out of three of those things, right? Same thing for distributed databases. So let's go through each of these one by one. Again, the idea is that it's this, this sort of Venn diagram where you have CAP, but you can never be in the middle here. You can never get a system that has, guarantees all these things. So the consistency just means linearizability. Think of this as a stronger version of ser serializability. Availability means that uh, at any given time, we can access any node and get any data uh, in, in our system. And then partition tolerance just means that if we start losing messages because the network goes down or machine goes down, that we can still process any response that we, we could ever want. So the NoSQL guys, they are going to be AP. They're going to they're uh, try to provide availability and partition tolerance in exchange for giving up consistency. Like that's the eventual consistency thing. Like I can't guarantee that if, if I tell you I, I made your, I, I tell you that your write succeeded, that I guarantee that everyone's going to see that write. In the sort of new SQL or the traditional transactional distributed database systems, they're going to try to do CP or CA. And in their world, if like I can't talk to a node, rather than keep keep on running, I just shut the whole thing down. And in that case, I give up. I give up uh, availability. All right, so let's go through each of these one by one. By one. I think we covered most of these already, but just to show them visually to, to understand what, what they actually mean. So again, with consistency, the idea is that if we do a write on one machine, that everyone should see that write before we tell the outside world that our, our write has succeeded. So our transaction is running on this application server here. It wants to set A to 2, and then we're going to propagate that change to this replica, and then we can tell the outside world that we'd acknowledge their write. And at this point, whether we read uh, a on the replica or on the master, we'll see A e equals 2, right? So another application server can immediately see, you know, after this write is succeeded, I can see A equals 2. And I get back the correct response. 
partition tolerance, or sorry, availability says that if this replica goes down, then either the mat, the this application server or this other application server can can read and write to anything that it wants here. Right? And then the last one is partition tolerance. The idea here is that say the network goes down. The network that I'm using to communicate between these two machines goes down. The machines don't go down, but the network goes down. Or my, 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 my messages, my packets are getting lost on the network. So now what's going to happen here? Well, so again, before we had master replica setup, and I said with master replica setup, you run Paxos to decide who the, who the master is. Uh, and then that's where all the updates are going to go. So that by this point, there's a, there's a network partition, so these guys can't communicate, but they know they're still up. Like, you know you're still alive. So now you run Paxos, and you find out, oh, I'm still alive, now I'm the new master. Right? So now, if my two application servers send at the exact same time updates to my database, this guy sets A equals 2, this guy sets A equals 3. Both of these nodes think they're their master because they ran Paxos. That was fine. You know, no one else outvoted us. We're the master. So we said, okay, it's okay for me to go ahead and make this change. We send the acknowledgement that we made that change. But now at some point, the network comes back and I need to reconcile this change and synchronize. And now you're screwed because now one guy says A equals 2 and this other guy says A equals 3. And we told the outside world that those rights succeeded. So, yes. So the question is, when can you have CP? You, you can't really. Now, I take that back. Yeah, so this is what I'm saying. It's sort of. So what would CP look like? CP would say, well, if the network goes down, uh, I, can't I, you know, I can't communicate with these two nodes. What should I do? So if I'm doing uh, like a case safety thing where I say, I need to have three copies of, of the data. At all times, and say I have another, I have another node over here. So these two guys would do say, hey, we have at least two copies. We're fine. We do leader election. This guy says he's the master. So now anybody can can do rights here, and then that's fine. This guy over here would say, well, my case safety is is two. But I, I only have one, so I have to shut down. I can't run anything. So therefore, I'm giving up availability. So in that case, I can handle. I'm technically handling the, the, the partition, the partition in the network by being not available on that side, but this side's okay. So this is called split brain in distributed systems. Like I have two sides, like two brain sides of the brain can't communicate and they both think they're, they're king of the world. So again, in a, in a traditional uh, transactional database system, they basically stop the system when you realize you can't communicate with everyone. Right? Or if you have a majority, then you say, I'm the new master. And so in this example here, if say this guy came back up, uh, well, assuming that assuming this guy, if this guy was allowed to make changes, because uh, it had, you know, his case safety factor was enough, then when I came back, I would have to have a human come in and resolve this change. We can't magically just do that in, in our system. And in that case, we, again, we stop the world and we, we, we go offline until someone comes in and fixes us. Yes? How to avoid the, the split brain? I think one, one key idea is to use the A system thing, right? Yes. To set K to be the, uh, how to say, half plus one, such that there could not be another. Correct. So his comment is, how do I avoid the split brain? Well, if your case safety factor is half the nodes plus one, that means that you, at least you're always guaranteed to have yeah, only one side could be could be the, the the be be the master, and the other guy fails. Yes, yeah. that's it. There's I mean, there's no the magic, right? Um, and again, so going back to the NoSQL guys, in their world, again, they're dealing with like in, in, traditionally we're dealing with like websites that you want to have be online twenty four seven. So in their world, they they would rather have the system be available and still serve requests. Albeit maybe they're 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 slightly wrong or delayed in getting the, all the changes, but that was better than being completely online. If you're dealing with money and you can't, you don't want, like I don't want to give out a thousand, you know, a million dollars to you that I don't have, and get a million dollars over here for you know because I have a split brain. In their world, they can't have that happen, so they'd rather take the whole thing down. So I'm not saying one is better than another. I'm saying for certain application scenarios, one one is prefer preferable. Um, 
but it's just sort of good to understand that like when you start designing a distributed data system, what trade-offs are you actually making? Okay. So let's just finish up quickly about federated data. So the CAT theorem, again, it's, it's been proved to be correct. Uh, in the late 2000s, there was some, if you go, if you go Google the phrase like defeated CAT theorem, there's a bunch of people making wild claims about how their databases defeated the CAT theorem and they were resoundingly put down as being stupid. Uh, it, it's like you can't have a distributed database. You can't have a distributed database that can do everything. You can do a bunch of extra stuff to try to mitigate the bottlenecks or sort of the issues you would have by having these these various these you know machine go down and things like that through redundancy, so that you can you know reduce the the likelihood of a network part, partition or things like that. But in, in the end of the day, they're unavoidable. At some point, you're going to run out of money, or the system is going to get too slow, and you're going to be you're, you're going to become beholden to it. All right, so let's just finish up quickly. So I just want to. Uh, Briefly mention what a, what a federated database is, so that if you ever see one or think about think about building one, uh, you just know what it is. So, in all in all the distributed databases we talked about so far, we have assumed that all the nodes are running the exact same database system software, right? It's you know it's it's a distributed version of MySQL, distributed version of CockroachDB, whatever. But sometimes in some systems, in, some, in sort of large organizations, you have these sort of one-off applications that are using you know, this type of database system, and then it's other applications using this other type of database system, and they need a way to sort of do maybe transactions across all of them, or do queries across all of them, so they appear as a single database instance, even though underneath the covers they're running completely different software. So this is what a federated database is, is designed to hope, designed to, to, to solve. And the idea is that we provide a single logical database instance, and we know how to take a, a single query that, that on that single database instance and break it up into uh, plan fragments that we can then possibly execute on the separate machines. And we just have a way to sort of put it all back together. So this was a big thing in the late 1980s, early 1990s, right? As, as companies and organizations got larger and there was more database deployments, we think, wouldn't it be great if we had a single interface for all our databases? It didn't pan out uh, because you end up dealing, you end up designing a system that has to do with the lowest common denominator of all your systems. Right? This system doesn't do transaction or this doesn't do th these type of queries, so we can't do that for our other systems. Right? So again, people have tried this, people still try this. Uh, it's usually a bad idea. It's not going to end well. You can do simple things, but you know, having this this beautiful all-in-one federated database is not going to work. So again, basic idea is like this. You have your application server, you have your middleware system, and you have your separate backend databases. So a single query goes to the middleware, and then it recognizes what all these different systems can actually support. And so it rewrites the portion of the query that you want to run on these different machines for their different APIs. Right? So MySQL does SQL, uh, MongoDB does JSON queries, Redis does um, uh, its own thing, and Subway is whatever. Right? So it knows how to take all those, those, those queries, break it up, and run it on, on those separate machines. And then you get back the result. So these things are usually called connectors. Right? They have the ability to communicate with these different databases and pull them into the single system. The one database that probably is the, the best positioned to do a federated database architecture is actually Postgres. So Postgres has this thing called the foreign data wrappers. Think of this as like a, an API where you can plug in different data sources that are outside the normal Postgres storage. So there's 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 foreign data wrappers for you know for 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 Mongo and all these other systems. So I write all my SQL queries in, to Postgres, then the foreign data wrapper knows how to go out to these individual systems and, and suck the data in, which I think is pretty cool. Okay. So any questions about any of this? As I said, yeah, yes, the back. All right, so this question is, can I recommend any distributed OLAP or OLTP system? OLAP. OLAP. Let's take this offline, because I mean, it's a complicated question. It depends on what are you trying to do. What does your data look like? How much data do you have? Do you want SQL or not, no SQL? Uh, no Why? <laughs> I'm not sure, maybe. <laughs> I mean, so, it, I mean, there's like, I mean, you've seen dbd.io. There's 600 databases, 660 whatever. Like, there's not going to be this one magic thing that like solves all the world's problems. You have to look at your application requirements and end up making compromises about what you know, what features you need, what features you don't need. 
how much money you're willing to spend. Right? So let's cover this next class. It's a, a popular distributed OLAP system, we'll cover that next class. Some popular distributed OLTP systems, um, so all the, the, the major vendors, SQL Server, uh, DB2, and, and, and Oracle, they all have their own distributed systems. Right? There's newer startups like Cockroach, TiDB, uh, Yugabyte, Fauna, Mongo's distributed. Right? They, all make, you know, they all have different trade-offs. We'll, I'll, I'll cover, I'll list out some OLAP systems in the next class. And actually, let's talk, let's talk offline. Maybe there's something we could cover at the potpourri in the last class. All right, so again, the main takeaway I talked about in the beginning is that we assumed all our database nodes in our system were friendly. That makes our life easier of how we do commits and transactions and replication. If they're not friendly, then that, that's what the blockchain is. And there's a bunch of extra work you have to do to prove that when we say commit transactions, we want to commit a transaction, that everybody actually committed a transaction. And in case of Bitcoin, that's all the hashing stuff they do with the, the Merkle trees. Okay? All right, so Monday's class next week will be the last lecture on distributed databases. We'll cover distributed OLAP systems. And I think that'll be the end of the material for the, for the semester uh, that, 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 that'll be covered on the final. On, when we come back after Thanksgiving, that'll be the, the guest lecture from Oracle, and then the system potpourri in the final review. Okay? Any questions? Alright guys, have a good weekend, see you. Oh dear, coming through with my shell and crew. Two cent for a case, give me St. Nas poo. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up can. Met the cows in the jam, oh how dry. It's with St. Nas in my system. Crack another, I'm blessed. Let's go get the next one and get over. The object is to stay sober. Lay on the sofa. Better yet, down my shoulder. Who be the wild, be Tim, stressed out. Could never be son. Rick is a jelly, hit the deli for a cold one. Naturally blessed, yes. My rap is like a laser beam. The pawns in the bushes. St. Nas in the canteen. Crack the bottle of the St. Nas. Sip it through those who don't realize. The drinking ain't only to be drunk. You can't drive. Keep my people still alive. And if the saint don't know you from a can of paint, paint.